Good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here for another flood update. Yesterday, I went out to assess damage and met with some who were impacted, stopping in to check on a few of the hardest hit communities. From road and bridge washouts to homes destroyed, the damage is significant. But as I visited towns yesterday and spoke with people, I was reminded of how resilient Vermonters really are. Even in the face of devastation, I saw many community members come together, doing what they can for their neighbors to help them get through this. We're continuing our work to manage the response, and the SEOC is coordinating with town officials and local emergency management directors to assess damage and provide assistance when necessary. This work is ongoing, and with local officials still very much in response mode, focused on life and safety and urgent needs, it will take a few days before we have a more complete understanding of the damage and what is needed for recovery and what we can expect in federal support. Today, in addition to response updates, we want to focus on the things Vermonters should, can do and should be doing over the next few days to get their homes, businesses, and property cleaned up and dried out to limit the risk of mold and further damage. While many went through this last year, we know it's overwhelming, and we want to make sure folks remember the key steps to help people get to a better place much faster and much sooner. Commissioner Morrison will offer specific steps regarding documenting damage cleaning out homes and yards, disposing of debris, and where to find help and equipment if needed. Dr. Levine will also, also offer some guidance to make sure everyone stays safe while doing so. As I said yesterday, we can all use what we learned last year to act quickly and strengthen our response, and that starts with getting homes, businesses, and communities clean and dry as quickly as possible. With that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Morrison. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. Most of our rescue operations have wrapped up. We have released out-of-state swift water assets, and most state teams are back in their communities. We will continue to have teams on standby until all rivers are below flood stage. To date, our teams rescued approximately 120 people, 15 animals, and have assisted with dozens of evacuations. This does not include the many rescues and assists carried out by local first responders. As of this morning, we are aware of two deaths that appear to be weather-related. You have reported on both of them, uh, but for the record, on Wednesday night, 33-year-old Dylan Kempton of Peachum died and yesterday, 73-year-old John Rice of Concord died. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the families and friends of both of these men. Uh, regarding weather and any potential for future flooding, uh, there is some river flooding that continued into this morning. Most rivers are receding, and no new flooding is expected. The following rivers were still in moderate flood stage, but were actively receding as of 8 o'clock this morning. The Pasumpsic River in Pasumpsic, the Winooski River in Essex Junction, and the Lamoille in Jeffersonville. While isolated showers and thunderstorms are expected for today and Saturday, no significant or widespread rainfall is anticipated through the weekend but there is a risk for very high and oppressive heat. The weather's gonna be in the high 80s, possibly low 90s later in the weekend. So those who are working on cleanup should take precautions such as start early when it's cooler, take frequent breaks and drink plenty of water. I suspect Dr. Levine will have more to say about that. Um, power outages. As of 9 o'clock, there were approximately 150, 150, 150 known power outages. Uh, I just want to point out that some restorations in this case are going to take longer than usual, simply because crews can't get to some places that might be at the end of a run or are otherwise 
uh, unable to be accessed because of the damage to local or state roads. As of this morning, we have had 250 reports of damage to 211. We strongly suspect that there's more damage out there, and we ask that you please report all damage. I'll talk more about 211 in a few minutes. So here's what we are doing. The State Emergency Operations Center remains active. We continue to encourage local emergency management directors to reach out when needs exceed local capacity. And we are here 24 hours a day. Emergency Operations Center staff are actively working with community liaisons and doing everything that they can to help communities manage flood-related flood, flood damage. Fire safety inspectors were in the field yesterday inspecting properties as quickly as possible. Yesterday, 58 inspections were completed. They will be out again today in the hardest hit communities. And here's what impacted people and communities should be doing. I'm going to describe some specific steps that residents and communities can take right now to move forward and begin the process of recovery. The first is document your damage. Take photographs and or video before you begin and as you proceed through your cleanup efforts. Save documentation of any expense that you incur during cleanup. Here's the 211 part. Report your damage to 211 and your insurance company. Use the online form at vermont211.org or if you don't have internet access, you can call 211 and select option five. Your report will help us have an accurate dollar amount of damage. Every report, no matter how small, helps move us closer to the thresholds that could trigger federal assistance. So even if you're planning to fix the damage yourself, or, or I guess live with the damage, please document it and report it to 211 because you are helping others by helping us get to the federal assistance thresholds. Step three is to start cleaning up and drying out, as the governor mentioned. Get the wet stuff out. We have dry weather forecasted for the next several days so take advantage of it and get the wet stuff out of the house. Step four, move all flood-related debris, I just want to sort of clearly state flood-related debris, to the right-of-way. Your community will communicate a plan for pickup and the state will assist local communities in making those plans. For community leaders, Continue to use your emergency management director to communicate your needs to the State Emergency Operations Center. We cannot help you if we do not know what you need for support. And lastly, for everyone, remain vigilant and be safe. This means staying out of floodwaters, observing road signs, and generally not putting yourself in a position that causes you to have to be rescued. There is a lot of damage to state and local roads crews are working feverishly to make repairs, but it's going to take time to get everything reopened. So if you see a road closed sign or other cautionary signage, please respect them. Do it for yourself so you can stay safe, but also do it so that you don't cause more damage to roads or jeopardize initial repair work that may have begun. I want to say a word about volunteering and accessing volunteer help. By now, reality has set in for most people impacted by the flooding, and they've realized that cleanup and recovery is not going to be easy. Thankfully, your fellow Vermonters are here to help. Volunteer assistance is available for those cleaning up their homes. Vermonters can call the state's crisis cleanup line to request help in cleaning up debris, mucking out basements, or other recovery work. You can call 802 242-2054 or go to crisis cleanup altogether crisiscleanup.org if you would like to volunteer to help your neighbors more help is always needed if you would like to volunteer for storm cleanup please register at www.vermont.gov forward slash volunteer
or you can simply roll up your sleeves, grab a shovel, and help your neighbors. Check with your town or an impacted town to see if there is a coordinated local cleanup event that you could take part in. Uh, as always, cash is king. Cash donations are the most efficient way to get aid to people and communities in need. You can donate to the Vermont Community Foundation's Flood Response and Recovery Fund online at vermontfloodresponse.org. Donations of food, clothing, and household items are best handled at the local level. Food shelves, community centers, and other local charities have the best information about the needs in that particular community, and they can always use donations. That is all I have for today, and I will be available for questions later, and I'll turn it over to Secretary Joe Flynn. Thank you, Commissioner Morrison. Good morning. Before I start listing roads and bridges, I just want to reemphasize what I said yesterday, that I'm speaking primarily about VTRAN's own state network, and that is not to fail to recognize the widespread damage that we've all seen, many, much of which thanks to you all for the pictures that you're sharing on media. <clears throat> the first thing I would like to say is that the Agency of Transportation will be releasing $29.5 million in town highway aid payments by early August. The first $14 million is working its way out the door the first part of next week. This is formula money for every town in Vermont, which is part of our budget, but this is a six-month slug of money that we're releasing immediately to help towns. So now I'll go through the list of closures. Yesterday, I told you there were 54 state-owned roads closed. I'm pleased to say today that number has dropped to 18. In that 18, it includes eight state-owned bridges that currently remain closed. The list is as follows. Route 15 in Cambridge at the Wrong Way Bridge. Route 17 in Addison. Route 17E in Bristol Starksboro, which includes one of the closed bridges. Route 116 in Hinesburg, which also includes one of the closed bridges. Route 5 in St. Johnsbury, near Hospital Hill. Two sites in Barton on Route 5, both closed bridges. Route 16 in East Hardwick, also a closed bridge. Route 58 in Orleans. <coughs> Route 2 in Plainfield, which includes a closed bridge. Multiple sites between Elmore and Worcester on Route 12. Route 17 in Faston. Route 100 in Duxbury, which is a closed bridge. Route 100B in Duxbury, excuse me, Moortown, which is a closed bridge. We hope to have that bridge open next week. Route 302, multiple sites in East Barrie. Route 302 at the intersection of 232 in Groton, Route 102, the Maidstone State Highway, Route 122 in Linden, and Route 141 in Canaan on the Canadian border at the port of entry. On the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail, I want to report three segments that are open for recreational use. Swanton to Cambridge Junction, St. Johnsbury to Danville, and Walden Heights to Hardwick Depot. Yesterday at this time, we did not know the extent of damage, but in sections that I haven't mentioned,
there are damage. And in one section in West Danville, there's a fairly significant spot that has been destroyed. The Missiscoy line is fully open, and the BB Spur in Newport is fully open. Active railroad, this would be freight railroad and Amtrak. We have eight closures, Barrie, Barnett, Pasumpsic, Orleans, Coventry. The western corridor between Middlebury and Burlington. This is new and this is the route of the Ethan Allen Amtrak. The train is currently stopping in Middlebury and Amtrak passengers are being bused to Burlington and bused back to Middlebury. Of course, this also significantly impacts temporarily freight movement into Burlington. Vermont Rail Systems reports they believe that this will be a fairly quick fix. The St. Lawrence and Atlantic between the Canadian border and Norton and Island Pond. This is a Genesee and Wyoming Railroad. Reports this morning to me of nine washouts in that stretch. The NECR line here in central Vermont in Middlesex. This is also a Genesee and Wyoming Railroad. It is the line for the Amtrak Vermonter, as well as freight. There are areas in Middlesex with significant washouts. The Vermonter is not running, nor is freight. Moving to public transit, the Morrisville Shopper and the U.S. Route 2 commuter are closed due to the road closures. All other transit routes in Vermont are operating as scheduled. And again, I want to just reemphasize the Town Highway Aid Formula money that every town, including those most significantly impacted, will begin to see soon. So at this time, I will turn it over to Swiftwater Team Leader Mike Cannon. Thank you. I gave his update. Roger that. <laughs> Is it me? Then, sure, yeah. Julie. Secretary Julie Moore. Good morning. Uh, today I'm going to provide information and updates on dams, parks and recreation, water and wastewater facilities, flood-related spills, river corridors, and landslides. Uh, before I get to the details, I want to emphasize a handful of the points uh, Commissioner Morrison made and add a couple ANR specific. We encourage all Vermonters to avoid floodwaters, recognizing they may be filled with pollutants and unseen hazards. It's important to follow advisories from state and town officials about drinking water safety. We're encouraging homeowners and building owners to contact the spill response team if you believe there's been a spill of hazardous materials in your basement or your basement has become contaminated with flood water, causing your storage tanks to leak. As you are sorting flood trash this weekend, please set aside any potentially hazardous materials into a separate pile and then check closures before you head to a state park, state land, or one of Vermont's many trails. There is a full uh, set of information available on the anr.vermont.gov slash flood webpage for uh, where we've compiled all flood related information. Speaking to dams, after reviewing total rainfall maps, the Dam Safety Program targeted outreach to 218 dams under our jurisdiction in the following impacted counties. Addison, Caledonia, Chittenden, Essex, Franklin, Lamoille, Orange, Orleans, and Washington. We have done two rounds of outreach at this point. First, uh, early on July 10th, warning dam owners of the impending storm. And then again yesterday, re and, um, reaching out directly to 218 dam owners. Um, there were 16 dam owners we were unable to reach via email uh, and followed up with phone calls and only a single dam owner uh, without active current contact information. Our team is continuing to monitor dams around the state and will work with these dam owners and our fellow regulators uh, to stay current on conditions. I'm pleased to report the Winooski River Valley flood control reservoirs continue to do their job well. 
Levels in the Waterbury Reservoir are stabilizing with plenty of storage remaining. And in Wrightsville and East Barrie, levels have begun to recede. All three dams have been inspected yesterday and will continue to be assessed as needed. I have an update from yesterday's press conference where Commissioner Batchelder spoke about Harvey's Lake Dam. Our team was on site yesterday afternoon and found that while the dam had been overtopped, it does not appear to be damaged. And so therefore, we do not expect impacts to lake level or downstream roads and infrastructure. We have also completed inspections of seven particularly at risk Northeast Kingdom dams yesterday afternoon and no damage was identified and have had uh, frequent contact with the owners of other large power dams, including Green Mountain Power and Morrisville Water and Light that's revealed no ongoing concerns for dam safety. In terms of drinking water, program staff have concluded proactive outreach. Currently, Barry City, Lindenville, Barnett, Plainfield, St. Johnsbury, Hardwick, and Richmond have identified concerns. There are five communities with boil water notices. That includes the two water districts in Barnett and individual water districts in Plainfield, St. Johnsbury, and Barry City. We also have nine wastewater treatment facilities that were impacted during this week's event. Seven of these systems experienced operational issues that we anticipate will resolve as floodwaters recede. Currently, we believe there are two facilities with structural damage, and these are the wastewater facilities in Plainfield and Hardwick. Our team is working with the impacted towns and facilities to find immediate solutions and begin the process of long-term fixes. Other towns in central Vermont and the Northeast Kingdom may be added to the list in coming days as contacts are made and 211 reports are made available. And we're actively reaching out to those wastewater facilities in known flood zones that we have that haven't reported to the, the state yet. In terms of parks, uh, our initial assessments indicate that really Region 4, which is our Northeast parks, bore the brunt of the storm. The hardest hit areas appear to be in the Groton State Forest and include Ricker Pond, Stillwater, Boulder Beach, Big Deer, and Sayon Lodge, along with Waterbury Center and Waterbury Reservoir's remote sites. We are canceling reservations at Ricker Pond, Stillwater, Smuggler's Notch, and Waterbury remote sites through early next week. Park staff are contacting individuals with reservations. We will continue to evaluate conditions and reopen parks based on the safety of visitors and park staff. Please check the park's website or Trail Finder website for the latest information. Speaking to landslides, our geology team has received four reports of flood-related landslides. Two new incidents in Moortown and Elmore that are being evaluated today. A third par parcel that was already in the process of a buyout following last year's flood event experienced additional slope failure in Wolcott. And there's an unconfirmed slope failure in Moncton that we will also be visiting today. The team will continue to monitor reports and conduct field visits as needed. Finally, on the waste management end, um, our waste management division continues to monitor the situation and is prepared to offer support as needed. Please report spills of oil, fuel, or other hazardous materials that you may have experienced as a result of flooding by calling 802-828-1138. The state has contractors available to assist homeowners who have heating oil releases or see a sheen on floodwaters in their home. And finally, our team of river management engineers um, is still in the very early stages of assessment and are working with local liaisons to understand where there may be in-stream debris piles or other constrictions uh, threatening in future flood events. We will work over the next week to create a better picture. If you have any questions about managing the river corridor on your property, please contact a DC river engineer before you begin work. Uh, again, all of this information is available and being regularly updated on our webpage, anr.vermont.gov slash flood. Thank you, and with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Levine.
Thank you. Good morning. I'd just like to start today by thanking everyone involved in this response for working so quickly and so hard to keep Vermonters safe. And to all Vermonters, your willingness to help and take care of one another never ceases to inspire me in difficult times. Like everyone, I'm sorry we're here again talking about recovery just one year after the state was devastated by floods. These weather events continue to challenge our collective resilience, especially for those of us who worked so hard to rebuild and were directly impacted yet again. Unfortunately, we do know that climate change will continue to make severe weather a threat to our world, so it's important to understand how it harms our health and what we can do in the short and long term to help protect against these impacts. As you heard yesterday, one of those impacts can be on mental health. I know that experiencing losses of your own, your neighbor, or your community, or just the stress and uncertainty surrounding crises like these can take a toll on mental health. Please recognize that it is completely okay and reach out for help if you know someone who is struggling. There is a National Disaster Stress Hotline you can call or text for support, 1-800-985-5990, and of course the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as Commissioner Hawes reminded everyone yesterday. As we all work towards recovering from this disaster, I want to share some very basic guidance to stay as safe and healthy as possible and give you a few simple take-home messages. First, we'll start with drinking water. If you're on a municipal water system, as you just heard from Secretary Moore, follow their guidance on boil water or do not drink orders. But if you are on a private well or spring and think that was flooded, you should assume that your water is contaminated. Don't drink your water or use it for cooking, baby formula, washing food, or brushing teeth until you have it tested. Get your water from a known safe source, such as bottled water or a municipal building. Starting at noon today, water test kits will be available to order for free through our, our online uh, store for anyone impacted by this week's flooding. Again, this is not for people on municipal water supplies. This is for those on wells. If that, we want to try to reduce any barriers you might have to getting a test kit. And if that proves challenging, going to our website, healthvermont.gov, or calling our laboratory, you can get one by contacting your local health office as well. Now, boiling water for one minute kills bacteria and other organisms, so it can be much safer after that. However, keep in mind that process does not affect water that is otherwise contaminated. So if your water looks cloudy, is full of sediments, or smells like chemicals or fuel, certainly do not drink it. Next, swim in water safety. Even once the skies have cleared, people and pets should stay out of any body of water after a heavy rain or flooding event. High water and strong undercurrents can linger and carry debris several days after a storm, making swimming or boating in these areas dangerous for anyone. Bodies of water can also be contaminated by microorganisms, fuel, and wastewater runoff. Not the news you want to hear prior to an anticipated very hot weekend but certainly swimming in contaminated water after a flood can result in serious safety risks or problems from infection. So it's best to consider another summer activity 
or a place to cool off until waters are calm and clear again. Next, returning to your home. Wait until your local health officials say it is safe and standing water has gone down. Watch for any downed power lines, gas leaks, or damaged fuel tanks. If you smell a rotten egg smell, which might mean natural gas, or hear hissing, leave immediately and call your local utility. If any electrical circuits or equipment have gotten wet or are in or near water, turn off the power if it's safe to do so. And never, of course, as we always say in the winter time, use a generator inside your home, basement, or garage, or less than 20 feet from any window, door, or vent. Finally, cleaning your home. If your home has been flooded and closed for several days, again, the assumption should be that your home has mold. You'll need to remove moldy items and dry out your home by opening doors and windows. You can use fan and dehumidifier when electricity is safe. Those who should not be helping clean up after a flood would include children, people who have any kind of breathing problems, and people who have weakened immune systems. Wear protective clothing and waterproof clothing including N95 masks and gloves. You can clean moldy items that do not absorb water using soap and water, but other materials like fabrics and cushions will probably need to be thrown away. Do not eat or drink anything that may have touched flood water and throw away contaminated food along with any foods that have not been refrigerated properly for more than a day. You can find more information by visiting our website at healthvermont.gov slash flood. I'll now turn it back to the governor for Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Levine. I will now open it up to questions. Have you been in contact with, say, our federal delegation or starting any FEMA talks conversations? Um, I had a uh, I had a conversation the day before the flood with the uh, FEMA director uh, Criswell, and um, and since then we've had uh, given the congressional delegation uh, a briefing uh, as to what what we saw. I think that happened yesterday, as well as with the uh, legislative uh, delegation. So we've been in contact with with everyone. Um, We'll be assessing the damage. We'll be uh, obviously requesting a, a declaration, um, but we need more information in order to uh, to provide that. If if we are granted help from FEMA, given the long process and really complicated process that a lot of Vermonters have been over over the last year, what's your expectation of what, how much FEMA will be able to help, and what should Vermonters be looking for over the next? Six months here. Yeah, I think we have to level set expectations as we've learned over the last uh, year uh, as, and since actually Irene. Um, FEMA doesn't solve all your problems, um, especially with individual assistance. So when, uh, and that's where the frustration typically comes through uh, because you have damage to your home, uh, you expect that FEMA will come in and, and rectify that and make you whole, but that doesn't happen. There's a cap on that. There's a forty-two thousand dollar cap, and that doesn't take care of all the damage that we're seeing even today. So, but there is private insurance as well that you might have with your homeowners. Um, you should access that, um, which is why we're trying to encourage people with any damage at all to uh, go to two one one, fill out the form, whatever damage you have and will help us meet whatever thresholds we need to make for uh, public assistance as well as individual assistance. So it's really important to do that, and whether or not you're going to take advantage of that, whether or not you're going to get anything in return, it will help the overall cause uh, to do so. One of the biggest concerns that I've heard over the last year was that 
recovery work, navigating through all of the paperwork is a full-time job on top of the jobs that people have to make ends meet, taking care of your kids, etc. Does the state have any resources to just physically like help people through the, the bureaucracy or the, the maze of paperwork? Yeah, we, uh, we try uh, to do whatever we can. We understand that it can get complicated, uh, but we try to make it as easy as possible. And I look for someone else who wants to jump in. Todd, Todd, Todd looks like he's ready to go. Um, so it's a great question, and I think we have learned a lot working through the FEMA process. Uh, Last year, as we recognized the gap between what people needed and where FEMA was able to step in, um, we brought on some resources and we'll look into doing that again this year uh, in an interim process to support people. Long term, and you know, this is the nature of a, a crisis like this, we do have partners who are doing disaster case management, of course. Uh, they were also impacted by the flood and need to recover. And that process, and I want to emphasize this, is a long-term recovery process. The other element I would highlight here is that we are fortunate in a sense that where we stand on the road to recovery from the 2023 flood, we have a tremendous number of volunteer heroes out there working in long-term recovery groups in many of the same communities that were hit uh, yesterday and the day before. Those are going to be crucial assets in the recovery phase to really helping connect individuals who have been harmed with and, and uh, whose homes and livelihoods have been damaged with recovery uh, assets and the real work of recovering, which again is a very long-term process. So we will continue to work with FEMA, of course, and we also will look to the volunteer processes and some of the state resources we've brought online. This might be a, a good time to level set expectations as well with businesses um, because that was a source of confusion before. We encourage everyone with any damage to call 211 uh, so that we can collect the data uh, that, uh, that we need uh, to, uh, to request assistance for public assistance uh, as well as individual assistance. But it also gives us a, a tool to accumulate and determine how much damage we have to businesses. And while FEMA does not, does not uh, take care of any business damage, there are SBA loans available uh, that's triggered. Um, but we also established our own program during the last, uh, uh, last year, and that was BGAP. Um, and, but we have to have a federal or a legislative authority uh, to do so, but it will help us make our case if we have the data in the in the queue so we would encourage everyone with whatever damage you have call to, or, or contact 211 uh, through the online process and uh, and tell us what the damage is so that we have the data uh, necessary to determine what our next steps are yeah why don't you go through that as well Governor did such a great job with that. But I did want to mention that um, Lindsay Curley, Secretary of the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, uh, we were able to stand up a resource center that we had uh, after last year's flooding. It's called the Severe Storm uh, Resource Guide. So it's on uh, www.accd.gov forward slash flood. And on that uh, resource guide, there's a variety of information. And, you know, first and foremost, I want to acknowledge that, you know, impacted business owners and employers are probably cleaning up right now. And so if they're not listening now, our website gives them an opportunity to go back and, you know, take a peek later at um, information that might be helpful. Some of what was covered today as well, we will be updating with. Um, but for those who are listening who may be helping their friends that are business owners and employers navigate, um, again, I encourage people to go look at this resource page. And as the governor mentioned, 211, there are separate forms for businesses and homeowners. So if you're a business owner, there's a form in there. And as I mentioned, I, uh, as the governor mentioned, that will help us understand the um, extent of the damage that people are dealing with. And I understand this is fluid and right now they're cleaning out and that is the most important is to clean up and get rid of that mold. But when they have time and after they've, they've made a way through that cleanup, 
and maybe somebody can help them and they start to document that, that will significantly help us in terms of recognizing what uh, financial or what uh, property damage they've had, what financial impact they're experiencing. So um, we can't emphasize that enough that that's helpful to us for Intel. Um, again, on that page also it talks about um, philanthropic um, support. Uh, again, after last year's flood, we got significant help through uh, the generosity of Vermonters. So we'll be adding as we learn of opportunities for Vermonters to make donations um, through safe uh, sites to donate on. We'll be putting that on there. And um, I'll provide more updates in the days ahead. Again, once we know business owners are maybe, you know, they've gotten through some of that cleanup. One more thing I just wanted to stress for some of the employers that went through this a year ago and maybe were spared this time, um, which I'm very uh, glad that happened. Uh, you may recall the feeling when somebody walked through your door, the relief that you had, that people showed up to help you. So um, think about some of the areas you're seeing pictures and the impact of people cleaning out and mucking out. So. Um, whether you have some downtime or you have friends that are asking how can they help, I want to point back to that volunteer page. Um, the importance of getting out there when it's safe, but getting out there and just picking up a shovel and putting your muck boots on and helping people clean up is, um, it is such an uplifting and inspirational uh, help to all of us. And it's going to mitigate and, uh, and keep the damage, the cost down if we can get that cleaned up sooner rather than later. So. That's all I have for now. We'll keep you updated. For the governor, for Secretary Moore, whether it was yesterday's storms, last year's, or really kind of any somewhat of significant rainfall, obviously rivers overflow, but also, um, oh, I'm blanking on the word all of a sudden. I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> culverts. 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 <laughs> it seems like washed out culverts are always a big issue no matter what the rainfall is. I mean, is there any way the state could be proactive, maybe some aging infrastructure, but looking at some of these more vulnerable culverts, whether it's through a legislative study, I know that would all cost money, but what can be done? Because it always just seems like these culverts are breaking and that's what's leading to a lot of the water overflow. Yeah, yeah and it's a little bit complicated. Um, we always assume that just upsizing a culvert is, is the answer. Uh, but you have to look downstream as well, uh, because when you increase the capacity, you're also increasing the flow, and somebody downstream is going to be impacted. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. We are constantly uh, looking at you know, culverts. Uh, might have Joe uh, talk about that as well as uh, Julie on on her end. Um, but um, but they're they're important, obviously. And when uh, we have structures uh, that um, that are impacted in some way uh, and aren't cleaned out and have debris in them, uh, that leads to a problem in the future. So we've, we've after the last, one of the lessons learned, I think, uh, with the last year's <coughs> storm was uh, to protect uh, some of the, the stormwater infrastructure, including culverts, but also uh, stormwater in, in some of the communities um, and um, making sure that that's all cleaned out after the storm and is constantly cleaned out. So we have the capacity to store some of that water and, and let it flow when it needs to, and rather than backing up into the streets. Maybe we'll start with Joe first, then go to Julie. Sure. Thank you. Uh, you're right. Culverts are one of our biggest problems, and not just for the state, but for towns. Speaking for VTRANS, we have 64,000 culverts just on the state network. We know where all of our culverts are. And that was quite a task. That's been a, a tremendous amount of work for probably the last 12 years to create that inventory because many of those culverts were put in before most of our current employees, including me, worked here. But we've accomplished that. So you can just imagine the magnitude of trying to replace that amount of infrastructure. infrastructure. We do replace culverts. We do have program capital projects every year to replace culverts and we work very closely with Secretary Moore's agency to get it right, to upsize the culverts, to take into account the environment, to take into account um, wildlife, uh, fisheries, and, and whatnot. There's a term for that. What I forget what it's called. But Habitat connectivity. Thank you. Well, I was, I was yes, that too. But what happens is, while we have these culverts programmed, and we work 
you know, primarily in the nine or so months that it's easy to replace culverts. We have events like this, or we have events like Richmond two years ago. Just to give you a sense of magnitude, that unplanned culvert failure was $15 million. We have over 300 of those exact size and same culverts just on our interstate highway system. And I believe the number across our entire network, like that culvert alone, is something like 1,600 of the 64,000. So you are absolutely right. I'm just trying to lay out really the magnitude of trying to, you know, upsize everything. And it, it's, you know, we, we chip away at everything we can. We probably, I could get you a number, but we probably, I know, in fact, that we replace hundreds of culverts a year. But with 64,000, and they vary in size. They're not all certainly like Richmond. Some of them might be 18 inches. But, uh, you know, it's just um, incredibly difficult. And I would say it's even more difficult for towns. We work with towns. We grant money, not just what I spoke about today, but we have other funds through our Better Back Roads program and whatnot. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's just a, it's a, it's a vulnerability, and they're out there every place. Talk about the uh, debris removal from last year yes. and uh, inspecting every single one to make sure that yes. we have cleared. So uh, going back to the prep for this storm, we, we did everything we could to ins inspect our system all over across our nine regions. Um, we worked in Barrie actually pulling out some debris from last year that we, I guess, either had forgotten was there or, or didn't know was there. There was a tree. This was right down here on the belt line. We pulled the tree out and under the tree was a trailer underwater. So, you know, there's still debris out there from last year. But w w last year after the July storms, we inspected hundreds, and I can get to that number, but I actually think it topped over a thousand. And you saw, you know, like if you ran out Route 12, you saw limbs and tree logs shoved through bridge rail and stuff. So we also pulled all that away so that wouldn't collect more debris in the next time. So it's a constant work. I can tell you that our districts, every single week I get a report from every district in the state. We have nine. And it tells me by category everything they do. And every week there's culvert work. Every week there's culvert replacement or there's culvert cleaning. And uh, it's just uh, it's a daunting task, but it's an important one. I guess I'll turn it over to Secretary Moore. Sure. And I might only add, uh, Vermont, following Tropical Storm Irene, adopted uh, really robust codes and standards for how bridges and culverts are replaced. So very much building on what Secretary Flynn alluded to. Um, setting sizing standards going forward that we know are capable of handling these kinds of more extreme events that we're seeing more frequently. Um, so recognizing immediately following a storm there will be a surge of work to address impacts that occurred, but also putting in place a framework that ensures um, as a matter of normal business, as municipalities and VTRANS is replacing bridges and culverts, they're doing it with that more um, current storm and extreme weather data in mind. Uh, ANR administers something called the Municipal Roads General Permit, and it, it um, relies on an, an inventory that each town at this point has completed, looking for those vulnerabilities in their system. Um, we drew a lot of, of that framework from the work VTRANS had done previously to inventory assets within their own system. And so know that over time, we will become more resilient, but it is a, a challenge just given the magnitude of the num sheer number of bridges and culverts that exist out there. Do we know how many, if at all, bridges and or culverts that washed out that were either replaced last year or from Tropical Storm Irene, these, these ones that you're, you're mentioning? Uh, I, I, can, uh, I can get you a, a better answer. But what I can tell you for certainty is after Irene, uh, I'm not aware of a bridge this time that washed out that was rebuilt after Irene. And I like to use the example of the Wrightsville Bridge, I'm sorry, Route 131 on your way into Cavendish at an intersection called uh, Whitesville Road. That bridge was significantly damaged in Irene. And it was built back to the standards Secretary Moore just spoke about. That the area down there was heavily impacted in July of 2023, that bridge withstood everything. So that is a classic example, and I believe I saw 
I know I saw on one of your stations, I apologize, this last week a story, may have been on five, a story of um, bridges in Jamaica in Wardsboro that were built back after Irene that were not damaged. Obviously, that part of the state didn't get damaged. But last summer, there was some damage, I obviously, down in the southern part of the state. So as far as the culverts this time, it's, it's really too soon to tell. Uh, but I'll be happy to report on that as I know more. Thank you. Governor, where do we stand with the proposal to redevelop the north end of Barrie? Um, we're still working on that. Uh, Pat Moulton, uh, who was here the other day, uh, yesterday, uh, is uh, is overseeing uh, that. Uh, we aren't. We had hoped to receive an appropriation from Congress on that uh, to jumpstart it, um, but it's uh, it's difficult, uh, especially with getting anything done in Congress at this point in time, and having the money appropriated uh, doesn't appear to be in the in the near future. But there are. Other uh, opportunities uh, that we're seeking out, we're working with the congressional delegation on that. Other pots of money where we've we've made application for grants, um, and we're hopeful that uh, a couple of those will will get us started. Um, it won't be all done in one, you know, one shot. It'll have to be done in phases. But there's again other opportunities with TIF districts and so forth, and working with the uh, the city council, the new mayor. Uh, in trying to get a, an idea of what, what the community wants and to put that all together. There's still the need. Uh, we still need housing. We needed housing before this, uh, this uh, latest crisis. And uh, we're, we're going to need it. Even, it's exacerbated that. Uh, when I went to Plainfield yesterday and saw the nine-unit uh, apartment home a house uh, there uh, that is no longer habitable, um, it just you know, furthers the point that we need housing now. Also earlier this year, you let the uh, Climate Superfund Act go into law without your signature. That bill is, of course, aimed at trying to sue fossil fuel companies to sort of recoup some of the costs for some of these expensive projects that we are um, looking at right now. What are the next steps from the state to, to get that rolling, if at all? And what is your assessment of like how much that will actually help, or whether that will help? And this is all in the hands of uh, the attorney general at this point, uh, and uh, and that they believe that they have a case uh, that they can make against big oil, so to speak, uh, to recoup some of these costs. I think it's uh, going to take uh, not weeks, not months, probably not years, probably decades before we'll see any anything back, but. Um, but they're probably more confident than I am. Um, again, it, uh, they'll, it's in their hands at this point, and probably a better question for them. Why aren't you confident? Because I think uh, we're a very small state with limited resources, and uh, this is a legal case uh, that's going to be difficult to prove. Uh, we have to, to prove harm, right? And so that's a, that's a high bar. And uh, for us uh, to make that case uh, in, in court uh, is going to be very, very difficult. Uh, big oil has a lot of money, a lot of resources, and, and who is it we are actually going to go after? So uh, again, I don't know if Secretary Moore wants to add anything to that, um, but we have, again, concerns about setting the expectations too high on this. And for some, they think that the money will just start flowing in much like tobacco money, but uh, but that took a long time as well, and I think this will take that much longer. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you.